Jeg skal op og tale med Rob Hopkins fra Totnes i England. Jeg glæder mig helt vildt, fordi Rob er en af mine største så personlige inspirationskilder. Det er, han er en af grundene til, hvorfor jeg arbejder med, med grøn omstilling på den måde. Det handler om lokalt engagement, det handler om at, at give folk nogle positive billeder, nogle positive fremtidsvisioner for, hvordan der ser ud på den anden side. Og jeg synes, det, der er helt særligt ved ham, er, at han på den ene side er god til at insistere på, på krisernes alvor, øh, men på den anden side også øh, tegner nogle positive billeder over, at der er nogle, nogle gode veje fremad. Øh, øh, og det er det, vi skal op og, og lave sammen, og vi har inviteret hele København til at komme og være med til at forestille os øh, en, øh, en smuk fremtid på den anden side af omstillingen sammen. Så det glæder mig helt vildt til. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. So tonight you are here. You are here for a for a historic night in the history of this city. Because for just one night only, we have turned this room into a time portal. Because I have come all the way from the south of England with a very powerful piece of technology. <laughs> this is our this is the time machine that we have developed. This is some serious quantum stuff. It would take me a long time to explain. Uh, but what we have done is we have turned this room here into a time machine. And when you step across, when we open the doors and you step into the future, you are going to be, we are going to count up to that time. So when you step across the door, you are stepping into 2035. It's not just any 2035, my friends. This is the 2035 that resulted from us doing absolutely everything we possibly could have done between now and then. They were the most exhilarating years to live through when things changed in a cascade that felt impossible in 2024. So when you step through that door you might find maybe the air smells a little different. Maybe there's a bit of a magic in the air. 2031, 2032, 2033, 2034, 2035. Because we are now here in, in the 2035 of the future, the 2035 that resulted from us doing everything we possibly could have, not a utopia, not a dystopia, but the future that resulted from our longing and our hard work and creating the future we wanted, I just wanted to sit for a minute or two in silence while you take a walk using your imagination around in that world. Take a walk, imagine you're walking out of the front of this building into the Copenhagen of that time. But use all of your senses. What does that future smell like and taste like and sound like and feel like? We both did not experience any cars in the future. Okay. But then there was an ambulance sound and then we <laughs> oh, thought maybe allowed. that's okay. Thank but you. And people were hugging each other and there was a really communal um, attitude and behavior. I saw more of a architecture because there wasn't any commercials and I also saw a lot of um, like art and like light installations and people doing like physical performance and arts in the streets. Thank it's you. really nice. Thank you. Well thank you so much for doing that. The writer Bell Hooks once said what we cannot imagine cannot come into being. And I feel like it, that we should see this as being like a, like a daily practice. Because actually the reality is in our lives, we do the opposite as a daily practice, right? We spend the day scrolling through news about how terrible everything is and how everything's gonna end and that there's no point in doing anything. We, and that is, has become like a daily practice. But we don't do a daily practice where we step into the future. As the poet Rilke said, uh, uh, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. 
actually uh, in my town of, of Totnes that I just showed you the picture of just now. Uh, we have been working very hard to build the world's first successful time machine and this is uh, my colleague and together we travel to 2030, 2035 to gather images and recordings of that future. There are many different futures. We talk about the future like it's one thing, right? There are many different threads that run out into very different futures and some of them are absolutely horrible. Believe me, I've been to see them. You really don't want to go there. Trust me on that. But there are some quantum threads that take us to the edge of possibility where there is a future that is really extraordinary, which is what I want to talk to you uh, about tonight. So as I said, we often travel together to gather recordings, to take pictures and uh, and in case you're still thinking Rob I don't believe you of course you can't time travel well I have film evidence of this okay so this is somebody who was round at my house the other day in my kitchen and caught film of me going off on one of my time traveling adventures so I'm just going to share that with you uh, by way of uh, by way of convincing you <laughs> So, uh, so I want to just, a little beginning by talking about, well, why do we do this? Why did we develop this time travel program? Because we are in a climate and ecological emergency, and I don't have long to go into the detail of it, so I just want to sum it up in five easy points. It's warming. It's us. We're sure. It's bad. We can fix it. That's really it in a nutshell. And actually, when we look at the only agreement that we have as a planet for how to sort this out, which is the Paris Agreement, which no governments are on track to keep, it wasn't ambitious enough when it was written, but it's the best thing that we have in terms of an international agreement, what that says is that by 2030, we need to have cut our emissions in half by 2030, which is why I'm so interested in 2030. That's not very far away. And the temptation is, people say, well, why don't you make it 2040? That would be easier, because we're, not, because we're not here to negotiate with physics. We're here to figure out what it would... So I'm not interested necessarily in what 2050 would look like when we've done everything. I'm more interested in that much nearer future when we're on track when we've gone over the curve and we're coming down and people are excited about the adventure. It feels like we're moving towards something rather than moving away from something that is irreplaceable somehow. So this is, sometimes people like to talk about the oil age as if it's a mountain that we have spent, and those of us in the global north have spent 400 years climbing this mountain. And now we stand on top and underneath our feet is more plastic, more carbon, more debt, more inequality than anyone ever stood on top of before. And the guides who are at our side, who know this mountain, are saying, we need to get down off here really quickly. You can see the storm clouds that are coming. We need to get down off here. One way to convince people to come down off the mountain is to talk about how awful and terrifying that storm is going to be. But maybe another way is to tell them stories of the valleys that wait for us at the bottom and the delicious food, the warm firesides, the comfortable mattresses, the dry socks that wait for us if we can get down there. And it's a journey towards something, not a journey away from something. The other way to look at the oil age is by turning that upside down and saying, actually, those 200 and something years of the petroleum interval were like a big, deep, dark lagoon that someone convinced us if only we could get to the bottom, there was gold and treasure that someone had thrown in there. And we've dived deeper and deeper. And the deeper we've dived, the harder it is to see each other, the harder it is to see the light. And then actually, when we give up on that myth that there's gold at the bottom, then every push away from the bottom is a move towards something, to fresh air, to sunlight, to connecting with other people. We have to see this time as the beginning of something, not as the end of everything, I think. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm a great believer in longing. Longing, for me, is one of the most powerful tools that we have in terms of doing this work. The, the novelist Don DeLillo once said, longing on a large scale is what makes history. Which is so beautiful, I'm going to say that twice. Longing on a large scale is what makes history. 
And longing is, is something that I think those of us who work in, in climate movements, in movements for social change, need to get much, much better at the cultivation of longing. And so one of my favorite stories about the power of longing is about the moon. So in 1865, Jules Verne wrote a book called From the Earth to the Moon. And uh, in his book, uh, the, I, these astronauts went, traveled to the moon. He pulled together the best science he could find about what going to the moon would be like. And then he wrote an exciting novel that told that story. That novel inspired scientists to then start to figure out how might we do it. And then that inspired more novelists. And we had this backwards and forwards between the scientists and the people who nurture longing uh, in society. And it built, and it built the first, the first uh, film that was made, uh, one of the first films with a story in 1902, A Trip to the Moon by Georges Méliès, a French film producer, told the story of a, of, of a trip to the moon. We, the longing to get there began to build and build uh, in our culture. We had science magazines like this that told again, trying to figure out how it might work and that edge between storytelling and science uh, grew and grew and grew. Uh, we, not all of it was necessarily sensible. We had absolute garbage movies like this. The Cat Women of the Moon. It says, uh, the, see the lost city of love-starved cat women. <laughs> There was a whole genre in the 1930s of films about exclusively male groups of astronauts arriving on the moon to find it populated with women who were desperate for men. It was a very strange thing. But there was about 10 of them that were made at that time. They were all dreadful. But what they were doing in the culture was they were building this longing, well, longing for, anyway, they, they, they were building a longing to get to the moon. Popeye went to the moon, Mighty Mouse went to the moon. Of course, very famously, Tintin uh, went to the moon. So it meant that in 1963, when JFK announced we will go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's difficult, we'd already been there thousands of times in stories, in songs, in jazz dances, and it meant that by the time we actually set foot on the moon, we'd been there. So when so Hergé made a cartoon, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, of them all already there saying, welcome to the moon, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> so the longing comes first. Rehearsing the future comes first. There's a, and so that, that, I feel, is something that we have to get much, much better at. And those, the people in our culture who are best at creating longing are storytellers and poets and artists and street design, designers, script writers. We need those people to be as part of this movement as much as we need everybody else. So, as I mentioned before, I take regular tr trips to 2030 with my colleague uh, Kit and we travel around and we go and see. And I'm gonna share with you some actual photos from 2030, and even a recording, a sound recording from 2030. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, that doesn't happen every day. That's what happens when you come when there's a time portal in this space. So I want, on a recent journey that we took there, we started here <coughs> on this street. It's a normal street, you know the street, it's just round the corner from your house, about you turn left and then right, it's that street down there. And we set our time machine up in there, and we set the controls for 2030, press the button, and when we stepped out, this street looked like this. Ooh. In just six years. And as, as our friend at the back said, the air smelled so much cleaner, the bird song was so much louder and more complex, but the other thing that I really noticed, the first impression, is, is a look in people's eyes. There's this sense of, I think we might just do this. There's an excitement, that kind of despair and despondency that we remember from 2024 was gone and replaced by this sense of shared adventure and shared possibility. When we turn around and look the other way down the street, it looked like this. And I remember this from 2024 and it was just cars. That change happened very quickly once it started. And my friends, the bicycle rush hours of 2030 were the most extraordinary thing. Rivers of bicycles in the morning, rivers of bicycles in the evening, because we built the infrastructure for that to happen, for that to work. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, you might remember in 2024, often when you drove into a big city, you would see signs like this for the car parks. They now have them for bicycles because they've built so many spaces for people to store their bicycles because they understood that for every million pounds, every million dollars we spend building good cycling infrastructure, we save 38 million off the national health bill. It's an investment, it's not an expense. It's an investment in health and well-being. And all those underground car parks that we don't need anymore, because as my friend over here said, there are so many less cars than there were before. Those spaces have been repurposed as places to store bicycles safely and cleanly, just fantastic. And it reminded me of back in 2023 when I went on holiday with my wife to Wales, and we saw this. And if any of you here are cyclists, and you can suggest what you would do with those, how you would use those spaces with your bicycle, I would love to hear. We spent 10 minutes looking at this, scratching our heads. In the end, all we could think was that maybe you just glued your bicycle to the, to the, to the ground. You know, so back then, we were often building cycling infrastructure that was useless. But by 2030, ah, it was incredible. Every train station you leave now, this is what you see when you come out of the station because we built the infrastructure and people used it. And you may remember in 2024 that the average size of cars every year got bigger and bigger and bigger. That trend reversed. And now we saw this. Isn't that sweet? That's much more, much more human scale, I think. And the way people build houses really, really changed because it became clear that 9% of all carbon emissions in the world were caused by the use of cement and we were running out of sand, so we had to rethink things. So now we build using much more local materials, timber, clay, straw, hemp, and it's created around every city, around every town, a whole industry producing and processing those materials, amazing for the local economy. The houses are much more beautiful, much more healthy, much more energy efficient, and we all are involved uh, in the creation of that. And even when we build bigger buildings now, like nine, 10 story blocks in the middle of cities, we build them using timber. Because, you know, in 2024, people used to say, oh, I don't think we can do this. We don't have all the answers. It's too complicated. I don't think we should start doing this until we have all the answers. Actually, what they, people found was, when they started, we found that we were hugely more brilliant than we imagined we were going to be. We solved the problems as we went along because we were committed to the process. And then the innovation followed. And even uh, this building that we went to visit where people now use mushrooms, materials, uh, using mushrooms. These are insulation panels for houses made using mushrooms and waste. And uh, Copenhagen just uh, this year opened its first all mushroom housing complex, which people are very, very excited about. Uh, and this was a place that we went to visit, and we saw many, many places like this when we went through 2030, which were streets where the people had come together to close that street and take it back as their own space. And they were very proud to show us a photograph of what it had looked like in 2024 and what it looked like now. And that change happened very, very quickly and it transformed the lives of the people on that street. And by 2030, the, the lovely thing was that actually uh, the way that we measure progress had really, really changed. It used to be that we just measured it in terms of is the economy bigger than it was last year? which is a stupid way to measure the success of everything. I'm a father, I have sons, I want my kids for a while, I wanted them to grow, and I did measure partly their success on the fact that they were bigger than they were the year before, and they grew, and ideally you want them to keep growing until they're just slightly shorter uh, than me, and then you want them to grow in other ways, to become kinder and smarter and, and, and more, more wonderful human beings. If my kids just kept growing and growing and growing until they were that tall, I would think something had gone horribly, horribly wrong. But that's our expectation for our economy in 2024. By 2030, it's changed. And now we measure the things that really matter, like the number of children playing in the streets, the number of girls able to cycle home on their own after dark, the number of people with good teeth, you know, the stuff that actually matters to people uh, and to an economy. And uh, this was something that we saw everywhere and gave me so much hope, which is the, the depaving 
of society, the removal of concrete and tarmac. Because you remember in 2026 and 2027, those really hot summers where we got to 32, 33 degrees and we realized the concrete and tarmac is dangerous at those sorts of temperatures. It holds heat that makes people really, really ill. So the depaving of our cities gathered pace very quickly. We went to visit this school yard uh, and they were very excited and happy to show us the pictures of what it had looked like back in 2024. They took all that concrete and away and it made the place much more porous of water, more space for biodiversity, more enjoyable for the kids. And we see the same pattern all across uh, the city here. And uh, now, and I actually brought back for you the front cover of Forbes magazine from 2030. How often does that happen? I took it, I went past a newsstand, I thought I'm gonna take that and show it to the good, good people of Copenhagen when I go there. And uh, this is the, the, the jobs that people are most excited about doing in 2030. No one wants to be a hedge fund manager anymore. Nobody wants to be uh, um, Elon Musk anymore. They want to be seaweed farmers and rooftop farmers and mushroom producers and imagination activists. The culture has really changed underneath all of this. And now young people leave school. They want to they grow the best oyster mushrooms in Copenhagen. They want to have the most productive rooftop in the whole city. The culture has changed and it was an exhilarating thing to see. There are times when I talk about, talk to people about having visited this future, that it becomes a very emotional thing to talk about because it's there, it's there as a tangible reality in front of us, if only we can organise ourselves now in 2024 to actually get there. We visited this neighbourhood which has been designed with no space for cars at all. The car's completely designed out of the fabric. It's for bicycles, it's for people. It's the most incredible place I've ever been. Cargo bikes, the whole space uh, just had the most beautiful. There is a car there, it is true, but that's just a, like a, they keep it as an educational tool for the kids. <laughs> and they grow fantastic courgettes in it in the summer as well. And, and I mentioned before that I had brought back an actual recording from 2030, and I'm going to play it to you now. And it's a recording of the centre of Copenhagen in 2030 with the best public transport you've ever seen and with no cars anymore. So you might like to close your eyes and imagine that you are stepping out of here into the centre of Copenhagen and that this is what it sounds like. So we collect lots of recordings like that to bring them back, that maybe if you can bring back recordings from the future, that's what helps to cultivate the longing. So we do a project called Field Recordings from the Future, where we use those recordings to make pieces of music to try and help people really immerse themselves in what that future could be like. We visited this extraordinary place, which is a school. Because by 2030, the education system has profoundly changed. Testing in schools was abolished in 2027, and now education is about imagination and compassion and democracy and all the skills that we need in this world that we are now in. And this school was a building that was designed by the kids. They worked with an architect for a year who worked with them. What, 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 school, what kind of school would you like? And this is what they designed. It's incredible. And it turns out that when you ask kids to design their own school, they all say it should have a rainforest in the middle of the school. And I'm happy to report to you that in 2030, 60% of schools in Denmark now have a rainforest in the middle. Denmark has, has met its rainforest in schools target. And it's led to a huge improvement in mental health and well-being among young people as a result. <clears throat> and uh, agriculture really changed as well because it was realised that you know, we, people talk about how between 2070 and 2024 we had lost 70% of all the creatures that we share this planet with. The word lost I think is very generous. I think probably exterminated is probably a more accurate word. But it became clear that, that we couldn't keep on doing that. And also when we, we needed to design more resilience into our agriculture system. So this was where we went to visit a place where there's much more agroforestry, much more productive trees, much more ground cover. We eat a more varied diet. 
We found when we were there that people eat about 80% less meat than they ate in 2024. But the thing that was so interesting was that nobody noticed that transition even happening. It just kind of happened and we realized we were eating less meat than we were before. And landscapes around our towns and our cities look much more like this. The food growing is much more part of everybody's lives, part of everyday experience. We all are involved somehow uh, in growing food. And as human beings, we develop the humility to recognize that beavers are much better hydrological engineers than human beings. So we just step back from those places, the upland places where the floodwaters came from that were creating so much damage and cost back in 2024, and we just handed them back to the beavers and they transformed them, holding so much more water, so much more complexity, the bio biodiversity exploded in those places just because we took a step back and had the humility to do that. These, these landscapes, visiting these landscapes that were created by beavers is like going to a, a good version of Jurassic Park. Like, it's kind of, you recognize it as your world, but it feels kind of otherworldly as well. It's just so full of life, it's just incredible, incredible. And the food system was very, very different. Everywhere we went, we got a sense of this very different food system because uh, people had developed a, a, new, a new way of doing it. This town that we went to visit, the municipality there had bought this land to create a food garden where they produced 70%, in 2024 they were producing 70% uh, uh, of all the food for the local schools and everything was organic. All, and in 2027, all those big companies like Sodexo, who provided really very poor quality school meals for kids, they were all gone because we had found a better way of doing it, which met the needs of communities so much better than what we had before. And of course, none of this came, it was not like all of this magically fell out of the sky. A lot of this was based on work people were already doing in 2024. You could see the beginnings of this, the seeds, the roots of this was already happening. And many of you are already doing that work, which, met, which for a lot, can, a lot of times can feel like you're on your own, nobody's interested. You are creating the foundations for what for what follows in a way that actually it might feel like at the moment no one comes up and says thanks for doing that that's amazing you're working so hard by 2030 the value of that is seen and is appreciated and this is a story in, in Liège in Belgium where in 2014 the, the transition group in Liège started a project based on a what-if question and the what-if question was what if in a generation's time the majority of the food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège beautiful and it opened up a conversation. Four years later, I went there in 2018. They had raised five million euros of investment from local people, not from the bank, not from the municipality, from the people of the city investing in 30 new cooperatives in that city. And uh, then I went, and then in 2024, that model had already spread to six other cities in Belgium. Uh, it was a model that the municipality then got really behind. They'd invested millions of euros in building a new food logistics hub. It was the model the city was using for how it changed procurement for schools, universities and hospitals. But it all started with a group of people in 2014 sitting around a table. In 2023, the mayor of Liège made me an honorary citizen of Liège because he said, uh, he said, until now, everybody thought Liège was quite rubbish really. And actually, you go everywhere telling everyone how brilliant Liège is. You're like an ambassador for our city. And so he gave me this big medal, and, and you are an honorary citizen of Liège. And I said, thank you very much. That's very kind. Could I have my European citizenship back as well, please? <laughs> I said, ah, Mr. Hopkins, that is not within my powers, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, uh, so, and of course, and the, one of the wonderful things that we saw in 2030 was the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the growth of renewable energy. Most of our energy now comes from renewable energy. Our cities are full of it. Our, uh, it's, it's how we do things. But the most powerful thing was that more than 50% of it is owned by people owned by communities, owned by citizens. So it's brought more democracy back into everybody's life as well, and that, that, that kind of sense of ownership. Oh, something's happened. I've lost the picture off the end. Okay, so but it's okay, I can, I can, uh, I can tell you what the last picture was. 
Because if we step back for a moment from that future and we step back into 2024, as the science fiction writer William Gibson said, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> All of those stories that I've told you that we saw in 2030 already exist in 2024. You can go and see them, you can touch them, you can feel them, you can speak to them. They're already there and they work. We're not waiting for someone to invent something magic. It all already exists. So we started in Amsterdam. This school is in, is in Madrid. Uh, this is in, in, a, in a place in France I went to. This is in Slovakia. This is in Cornwall. This is a town in France called Montsartu. Uh, and this is Liège and so on. So everything we need to know already exists. What's missing is, is the longing, I think. And if we just spend all of our time as activists talking about extinction and collapse and trying to terrify people with narratives about what happens if we don't do anything, I think we miss out on the really, really important piece of this story, which is what we could do if we do do something and what it could be like. And, uh, and to do that, in the, our movements become as seductive as they can possibly be in terms of the stories that we tell about the future. So I want to get you to do another little exercise now with your partner, if I may. And in this exercise, with your partner, you're planning a picnic together. And you take it in turns to make suggestions. It's like suggestions tennis, OK? And so in the first round, the idea is that one of you is going to make a suggestion. And the role of the other person is just to drown that suggestion in as much negativity as you can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we're now we're going to do that again. It's the same thing. You're going to take it in turns. This time, you're going to accept the other person's suggestion. Uh, yeah, well, maybe. But just with absolutely no enthusiasm at all. <laughs> Those of you here tonight who are activists or who are trying to change the world within organisations or within movements, those first two probably feel very, very familiar. <laughs> Am I right? We meet it all the time. Oh, yes, but. Oh, there's no money. Oh, we tried that, it didn't work. Yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. We live in a world of yes, but. OK, so for this last one, you're going you're gonna to accept your, the other person's offer and you're going to yes and. You're going to add to it. You're going to allow yourselves together to create something ridiculous that can only exist because you're listening to each other. So allow yourselves to create something that can only exist because you're listening to each other and you're offering your yes and to the other person. Go. You should see, it's so beautiful to see you when you're all doing that activity. It's like the whole room fills up with laughter and bright eyes and connection and listening. It's just gorgeous. And I think, you know, having been around the environmental movement since I was about 14, I've grown up with this kind of myth that in order, in order for us to be successful and to, to, to create a world like that, getting there has to feel like a long walk home in the rain on a cold November Thursday. And if you're having fun, you're not doing it properly. <laughs> it should feel like that. Yeah. So uh, something else that I want to get you to do now as well with your partner is to have a think about some what-if questions. A good what-if question gives you a, makes you curious, gives you a taste of how the future could be. What were the what-if questions that people were asking each other that made the really ambitious, audacious, bold what-if questions that people asked? What were they? Yeah. <laughs> 
What if animals could vote? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. What if um, we just made it so that the internet didn't work during the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman behind you there. What if we created large connected corridors, uh, green corridors throughout the whole of Denmark? And I said by 2030, one of the things is that people have learned to embrace wearing different coloured socks. It's become very, very fashionable because you can make the amount of socks in the world last twice as long. And luckily in my house, we have been pioneering this trend <laughs> for many, many years. <laughs> At the back. What, is it, what if it was mandatory in school to learn about nature and what we're part of so you can nourish and take care of what you know? Beautiful. Thank you. I, about in 2020, I saw a t-shirt slogan that changed my life, which was a young woman at the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington, and it said, I've been to the future, we won. Thank you. <laughs>